thank you once again for joining us. This is our Wheel and Anchor webinar on the majestic fjords of Norway, a destination where we're heading in the end of April next year, April 27th to May 14th to be exact. Uh, just briefly for the few of you who have not attended one of our webinars before, Wheel and Anchor is a travel community. And our mission is to, uh, or, or one of the visions when I started this company a few years back was to bring travelers together because um, as you'll see from all the happy faces in the photos on the, on the screen, uh, you know, I've had the pleasure of traveling with people from all across Canada and, and other parts of the world as well, but predominantly Canadians for the better part of 30 years. And my experience has taught me that when you have a bunch of like-minded people who get together um, and have kind of the same view about, about what travel is about and why they're there for, we just have a lot of fun and, and we're anxious for, for more and, and we're, we're, we feel enriched afterwards. It's a different experience than just joining an ordinary tour group. So it's a nuanced thing. And part of it is about being well-traveled. And, you know, as, as I say time and time again, and I can't emphasize it enough, being well-traveled is more than just sitting in a bus and ticking off the, you know, the places on the list that are on the itinerary. It's about venturing off on your own a bit, you know, getting lost down an alleyway somewhere, running into some strangers and, and having some unexpected event that really um, shapes the memories that you have of a place. And invariably, it also leads you to being um, well-connected. Um, with your other tour members, with people you meet along the way. We've had some incredible friendships that have been established by participating on our trips, um, but also connected to the people that we meet along the way. And I really try to make an effort that we, that we stop and talk to the locals because that's part of the, the richness of travel is really learning, the pe learning about the people that live in the destinations and what their lives are all about. On our webinar today, of course, so I'm Gordon. I think I've met uh, the majority of you before, founder of Wheel and Anchor. Um, my colleague, Joel, and as well as Paula, they're in the background here um, and provide vital support to the execution of this uh, webinar, as well as to all of the operations at Wheel and Anchor. Um, and today, it's about taking you um, and you have an interest in, or you're wondering about um, Norway, and I know a few of you had signed up for the trip that was supposed to happen this year, uh, and uh, of course it couldn't happen, and so I'm going to be your guide uh, and take you through this little, little journey uh, as we move uh, up this incredibly beautiful, picturesque coast of Norway um, in April of next year. So that's what our plan is for today. Um, let me just give you a few anecdotes about Norway because I, I said it uh, before we started the webinar and I have to say it again. This is one of my absolute favorite trips. And I know it's a difficult thing for me to say because as I was saying, I, I like all the trips that we do. I, I mean, I love to travel. Obviously, that's why I've been doing that, doing this for all these years. Um, but there's something about Norway that I find um, just incredible on so many levels. Uh, and it's partly because um, the scenery on this voyage uh, up the coast of Norway is, it changes constantly. There's something new and different to be seen uh, the, the whole way up. And the people that you meet and the fact that you're on a working ship um, that's loading and unloading cargo and you see fishermen and you see, um, you know, people going out to the, uh, to the oil platforms, you just see such a diversity of activity. Um, and Norway as a country is always consistently rated one of the, the best places in the world, one of the most advanced economies, the highest standard of living. And you get to see that up close and personal. And I always think about, you know, um, some of the shortcomings we have at home, not to say Canada is also, obviously also up there, but what is another country that has a different approach to sort of civic responsibility and, and, and how people relate to each other. And there's, you, you, we see that in all aspects of this trip. So it's the scenery, it's the people, it's the, the culture, the infrastructure, so many different things that make Norway um, really, really a special place. So um, looking at where our itinerary will take us, we're gonna fly into Oslo, the capital of Norway, which is down there in the very um, Southern part of the country. Uh, and from there, after a few days exploring this, the smallest, uh, one of the smallest European capitals, I think only Reykjavik is smaller than Oslo in terms of uh, the population. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting and it's 
combination between a lot of old history, but um, but also some some incredibly modern buildings like the Opera House. We'll see in just a moment. We'll cross the the country from uh, east to west by train, going high up into the mountains, going down on the Flam Railway uh, to uh, the Sogne Fjord before we end up in Bergen, the second largest uh, city in the country. Um, and it's here that we'll embark on our Hurtigruten vessel and make our way for our 11 day voyage all the way up past the Arctic Circle, well past the Arctic Circle to the Russian border and back. Um, and then Bergen is where we'll end our journey and, uh, and then continue back home from there. So let's go into the day by day. Um, and I wanna point out that the first few days of these trip of, of this trip, like more and more of the trips that we're doing, we've designed it with enough time to explore on your own because Oslo, like so many other places, is cool to just sort of wander about. Um, and of course, we always point you in the right direction. Um, we've selected some great restaurants to enjoy our meals. Uh, and so we don't follow sort of the traditional tour group type um, itinerary. We're doing things um, using, public, using public transport. They have an excellent system there. You'll see it as soon as you um, walk out into the magnificent Oslo Gardamon Airport uh, and then into this express train that takes you at 200 kilometers an hour into downtown Oslo. You'll be astounded about how modern and impressive this city is um, for its size. It's only half a million people. Uh, but yet they have a, a fantastic transportation infrastructure. So, um, so as I say, we'll arrive into Oslo, um, probably as with any transatlantic uh, flights, you'll fly because there are no direct flights from Canada to Oslo. So you'll go by a, you know, Amsterdam or Frankfurt or something and arrive probably um, late morning or midday. Uh, and uh, you'll uh, come to the hotel and uh, head straight downtown on the airport express train, and then we'll have time for a bit of a, an orientation tour. Um, the hotel that I've selected, I've stayed in a number of times right by the railway station. Um, and uh, from there, you can walk to a lot of the most important sites um, in the, the old district of Oslo. So um, after our first day and our first night, we'll have a nice welcome dinner somewhere. Um, we have two full days in Oslo in which to uh, explore the city. Uh, and we'll do that partly uh, with the assistance of a local guide um, who's going to spend the, at least the first half of the day with us and show us some of the sites like, which is just walking distance from our hotel, this spectacular opera house that they've actually built since the last time I was in Norway. Um, so I'm dying to see it because as you can see, it is, uh, it's a pretty dramatic structure. Um, so if, if, if you think about other opera houses in the world, like Sydney in particular, um, that have very striking architectural forms, um, this one certainly um, fits the bill and sort of glides right into the, uh, the Oslo Fjord. Um, but there's so many other things to see. Um, we're gonna hand each uh, participant on the trip uh, what they call an Oslo pass, so that for the time that we have on our own, um, you'll be uh, wander around and see some of the other different sites that our guide points out that I point out. I've been to also many, many times uh, and, and I can sort of point you in the direction of, of some of the other things to see. So the second day, uh, the day three of the trip, the third, um, the second full day that we spend in Oslo, um, you'll have time on your own. And uh, of course, Norway hosted the Olympics twice. You might, you might, you'll remember probably the last one in 1994 up in Lillehammer, a couple hours outside of Oslo, but Oslo itself hosted the Olympics back in 1952. And they built this um, ski jump, which I mean, let's face it, it does look like a little bit like a phallic symbol, but it's this free form ski jump sitting on a hill way above the city. And you can head out there by um, by uh, local local train and, uh, and and bus and get an incredible view of the city and um, the, the 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 fjord and, and this whole landscape around it. But apart from that, there's so many other things to do. Personally, I can't um, visit Oslo with stopping in at uh, they have this peninsula, the Bugdoy Peninsula, where they have a bunch of museums like like the Viking Ship Museum. Of course, the Norwegians you know, known as, you know, the Vikings, uh, Leif uh, Erikson and, 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 and the like that sailed across uh, the Atlantic Ocean in, in the days before Christopher, Christopher Columbus. And they actually have the original um, Viking ships that they have sort of reassembled that are literally hundreds and hundreds of years old. It's a fascinating thing to visit. 
Um, so, so many other things to, to, to see in, in Oslo that um, you'll, you'll um, beg for more time than we actually have, but we've got a good two and a half days, um, which will give you a great taste of the city. Uh, and then we will pack up our things on, on the fourth day and at um, 8.03 in the morning, I think the time schedule hasn't changed in the, in the 20 years that I've been going to Nor Norway. And we embark on a rail journey that takes us across the very picturesque landscape of Norway. And it takes us down from Oslo, which is basically, which is at sea level, all the way high up into the mountains uh, that form, you know, a chain that run down almost the whole length of the country. Um, and we disembark uh, up at one of the highest railway stations called Myrdal and got on this Flam Railway. And the Flam Railway is consistently rated as one of the top railway journeys in the world. It's not long. It's only about in about 45 minutes time. We go from um, 882 uh, meters above sea level, sorry, 867 meters above sea level. I get the number wrong. Um, all the way down and it's one of the steepest non cogwheel railways in the world. Um, so it manages to, to wind through um, with, with waterfalls coming up. And at this time of the year, it's part of the reason I like to go in May because you still get a lot of water flowing off the mountains. Um, so you get spectacular waterfalls, these little villages. And next thing you know, boom, um, you're down at the town of Flam. We spend a little bit of time, time to grab a, a snack for lunch. And then we hop on a ferry for our first venture down one of the fjords, um, an arm of the Sogne Fjord, which is of course the longest fjord in the world. Uh, and we head out into the fjord and then up another narrow one called the Neroy Fjord. Uh, so we spend about an hour and 20 minutes on a boat uh, and then head up um, from there through a very windy road go back to the railway and then we complete our journey to Bergen. So it's a very, very, very memorable trip. I can't tell you like Instagram opportunities at, at every corner. Um, I can tell you that. So I've, uh, I, I did this trip the first time. Um, oh my goodness, about uh, 20, 25 years ago. <laughs> and so, and I look forward to it every single time. So we'll arrive in Bergen. We'll have a couple of nights in Bergen. Uh, and this this town actually is sort of a special place in my heart as well. I, uh, I got stuck here as a backpacker in the early 1990s. Uh, and uh, I, I really enjoyed the city. Um, one thing I have to say about Norway and is it's an expensive country, right? Uh, since they discovered oil off the coast of Norway some 30 years ago, it went from being a relatively, um, um, how should we say, poor to sort of middle income country to all of a sudden it exploded. The standard of living went up. Of course, Norway is known for ha having one of the biggest sovereign wealth um, funds in the world. Uh, and all of this, uh, this money dispersed among the population of only four and a half million people has meant that they've been able to take you know, cities, which was basically Bergen was like a fishing village um, until uh, the, the 1970s and early 80s. Uh, and then, and then boom, they took, they transformed the city. Uh, in particular, uh, you see here, that this is the Hanseatic Wharf area. And that, that is the historical part that dates back to like the 15th century, um, where the Hanseatic League was based uh, and, and essentially did all their exploration in this part of, of Europe uh, and, uh, and really an incredible display of, of history. While we're in Bergen, same thing. We'll have a, a good half a day with a local guide who will point out some of the more um, interesting spots. Very walkable as well from our hotel. We can you know, hit up most of the, the interesting sites of this, uh, this charming coastal town. Um, and then we'll still have the whole balance of that day. Um, here we have what we call a Bergen Pass, which is similar to the Oslo card. You can use the transport. You don't even need public transit hardly, uh, unless you go out to um, one of Bergen's famous sons was Edvard Grieg, the famous composer. You'll be familiar with that Pierre Gint opera that he wrote. Um, and uh, um, that's the one thing that you have to take a, a bus to get out to. But for the most part, um, you can, uh, get around and see everything there is to see on foot. 
um, you might head up the Fjellheisen, um, sorry, not the Fjellheisen, the, uh, the Floybanen is the, the funicular that heads up to a viewpoint that again allows you another incredible vista panorama over the city of Bergen. So um, two days to uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy Bergen. Uh, and uh, they have a terrific fish market. So for seafood lovers, you know, the freshest of fish and seafood um, right there at the wharf. Uh, and they make like these um, prawn sandwiches. Oh, just terrific stuff. So um, Bergen's a great town. And it is also the embarkation point for our Hurtigruten cruise, which will uh, commence here. So in the late afternoon of uh, day six, we will uh, head to the Hurtigruten pier, uh, uh, pier or terminal, uh, and we shall get on board this beauty, the M MS Richard With. Uh, Richard With was is the, the name of one of the founders of Hurtigruten, um, which is why the, the ship bears this name. And it is one of a fleet of about, I think there's about uh, 10 vessels that are almost identical to this, uh, that, that form part of the, the Hurtigruten fleet. Um, and so I, I want to tell you a few things about, uh, about Hurtigruten and about this ship. So this is the route of the original coasters, coastal steamer. So for the last 120 years, ships have gone from Bergen all the way up on the same route that we're taking and back. Because as you will see as we go along the trip, the coast of Norway is so rugged um, and these, these fjords jut so far inland and the Asagne Fjord is 260 some odd kilometers inland um, that road travel is very long and arduous. Um, and so uh, as a result, the fastest way um, to move um, goods and passengers, and I mean, now of course they have air connections across, the, uh, across all these towns and cities, but for, for the most part, it was by ship. That's how they've always done it. You can liken it to, to our um, you know, CP rail in Canada that, that, that sort of brought the country together. Um, and it's the same thing with the, the Hurtigruten route. So the ship, ships that still operate today still save that, still serve that same function in that they aren't just cruise ships. Um, in fact, they aren't cruise ships at all. They're a combination between ships that bring um, tourists, so people like ourselves, to view the incredible coastline, but it's also a transport system. It's part of the, the public transport system is if you, if you will. So on board, you'll have passengers that are simply going from one port to the next. You'll run into like university students that are uh, heading up to school in Trondheim, for example, um, that might live in one of the towns that's along the route. Um, and, you know, and you'll visit just, you know, regular Norwegians. And that's kind of the fun of it. It makes it different than an ordinary cruise, right? There's big cruises, you can go on the QE2 to Norway and, and hit a couple of these ports, but it's not the same experience as going on Um The ship itself is functional and very elegant. In fact, the, the Richard With was the last one to be completely overhauled uh, just a couple of years ago. And they, they, they've done it super, super stylish. So you can imagine sort of this Scandinavian modern design. Uh, and it consists of uh, one large restaurant where they have, um, you know, excellent food. Um, the food on board is, uh, they, they um, introduced a concept about three, four years ago, uh, three, four years ago called the Norwegian Coastal Kitchen. So it's basically a farm to table type concept. And they pride themselves on actually picking up fresh produce from um, farms and so on all the way along the route. Um, so great food on board. Obviously, there's a lot of seafood, but even if you don't eat seafood, they have a terrific selection of stuff. They also have an, a little a la carte restaurant. So if you're, um, if you have a, a want to have a snack in between, um, never shortage of food. The one thing that's different on these ships is, again, it's not a cruise ship. There's no entertainment on board. I mean, they do have a, often a guy that's playing piano in the in the main lobby or uh, near the restaurant or in the bar, but that's about it. Um, because the entertainment aboard the ship is really all about the scenery that you're passing that is ever changing the whole way along. Um, and so that's, that's a big factor because I know some people I, that I've met on board the ship um, didn't realize that and they thought they were booking onto a cruise ship. Yeah, so there's, there's no um, entertainment. They have um, in recent years um, put some expedition staff aboard the ship. So people that can uh, interpret for you a little bit about um, you know, the, the, the geology and um, 
the 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 the, the meteorology and the you know the, the 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 flora and the fauna they can explain a little bit about um, what is um, unique to, to to Norway. So that's that's a very positive um, feature on the boat. Lots of ex lots of um, um, observation areas, as you can see, both inside and out. So um, the ship is uh, really quite perfect. One more thing I want to say about the ship, Joel, just to jump ahead for me for a second. The cabins you'll see uh, there. So the cabins are what you, smaller than what you'll find on an ordinary cruise ship. And I want to be very upfront about that. They're cozy. Um, there's ample room in there. I mean, I don't, you know, if you come with two giant suitcases, you may, you may struggle a little bit, um, but they've designed them super, super well. But the, most of the cabins, other than the suites, are sort of in the 14, 15, uh, I think 14 to 17 square meters. So they're, they, you know, they're on the cozy side. But on this voyage, you'll find literally you only sleep in the cabin at night. And otherwise, there's so many places to sit and enjoy the scenery. Um, but I wanted to point that out because, um, yeah, because I like to, I like you to know exactly what it is that you're in for. Anyway, let's move back to the trip. Um, so we'll sail out of Birken in the night. And of course we sail all day and all night for the next 11 days, right? There's no, uh, there's, there's no break. Um, and I'll explain why that's um, important in a moment. So we'll pass a few towns in the middle of the night um, that we won't see on the way north, but we'll catch them up on the way south because that's how the itinerary works. And in the morning, we will arrive into the beautiful town of Olesund. Um, and Olesund is known as an Art Nouveau city. In fact, it was designated by as one of the European cities of uh, culture uh, a few years ago um, because you'll seldom find a place in the world that has as much um, Art Nouveau architecture all packed into the center of this town. Part of the reason for that is, is that back in the early part, early 1900s, I think it was around 1908, the entire city burnt to the ground and they had to build it up from scratch. So the mayor at the time said, let's make all the buildings look nice and make them Art Nouveau. Um, and it's here in this town, it's actually the picture I usually put in, it's, it's probably in the magazine, um, but you can climb up and get this breathtaking view over the city and all the fjords around. I'm all about sort of viewpoints and vista points and Olesund has one of the best ones, that's for sure. So we'll spend a little bit of time in Olesund as we do in all the ports along the way. So the ship stops at 34 ports of call in each direction. So that means in total, there are uh, 67 uh, stops that you make during this 11 days. You think 67 stops, that's crazy. Um, but we do really stop in these smaller um, fishing villages, sometimes for as short as 15 minutes. But the beauty about this trip is, is that you can get out anywhere. So there's no place that you can't get off the ship. Now you might have to get right back on again, but you can get off and there's always sort of a little bit of a hustle bustle um, at the pier because when the Hurtgruten ship comes in, um, which runs daily, right? It goes every single day of the year. Um, and often the townspeople come out and wave it in. It's, you know, it's like if you live in somewhere in the prairie provinces and the, you know, the via train pulls it or the Canadian pulls in, right? It's, it's almost like a little celebration, like, oh, somebody from the rest of civilization is here. Anyway, moving along, um, as I say, we stop at various cities and towns along the way. Uh, and I'm not going to go into all of them because there's 67 and we'd be here all day. Um, but uh, the following day, we will pull into the town of Trondheim. And Trondheim is the fourth biggest town in Norway. Um, it's a university town and uh, it's known uh, as, a, as a foodie town. Now, of course, we have most of our meals aboard the ship, but it's uh, always good. And in Trondheim, I think we stop for about four or five hours. So we have a chance to get out and wander around the city, for example, to, um, to the beautiful inner harbor area that you see with all the colorful buildings. This is how it looks across Norway. You see these pastel colors, particularly red, like that's Norwegian red, um, the, like the building that you see in the picture. Um, um, so uh, one thing about shore excursions on this trip is that um, there, they actually have a huge number of shore excursions to choose from. So some of them are sort of culture and history. If you're in a city, like an architectural type tour, some of them are uh, more about wilderness, like, you know, birds or whale watching or this kind of thing. Um, and so what we've done is we've chosen um, sort of the best six or the most popular six 
excursions and put them into the program. The one that we do in Trondheim, we actually do on the reverse journey. So we head over to the Nidaros Cathedral, which is this giant cathedral. It's um, the, the, the biggest religious building in the country um, with some incredible uh, gargoyles on it. But we'll visit that, this, that one on the way back. So here, what I typically do is I go out with the members that wish to wander around a bit. We go into town and uh, I show you some of the, um, the sites of this very, very interesting um, university town. But of course, you're welcome to um, sign up for any of the other excursions. We can provide you a complete list that you like. Um, in case there's one or the other thing that particularly interests you and you have the flexibility to do that. I would say most people on average on, on this uh, voyage, at least what I've seen, do somewhere between sort of six to nine excursions. It's kind of enough because there's so much to see while you're going on um, that, you know, unless you, you know, first of all, have really deep pockets and want to do something every single day, which you easily could. Um, but for the most part, taking in the scenery is what it's all about. Anyway, moving on from Trondheim, our ship continues up north. Um, obviously, we're making our way up and down in and out of the, um, uh, out of the fjords. Um, for the most part, you're traveling in sort of what's sort of like an inside passage, if you will. So I know a question will certainly come, you know, how rough are the seas? Um, and there are certain bits where we're out in open ocean and uh, it's the North Atlantic, so you can get some movement. It's seldom that bad. Like one of the other reasons I choose May is because it's the driest and one of the least windy months of the year. So my experience has been, and I've done this trip um, at least 10 times, I think 11 times, uh, and I've never really had super high seas. Like it just, it's just, it's not very common. Um, so, um, we, uh, as I say, we make our way north and we hit the Arctic Circle. And the interesting thing about Norway is, is the Arctic Circle bisects the country. So if you think about where the Arctic Circle runs in Canada, I, I dare say that the vast majority of us have never been up there um, because it's, it's, uh, it's way up um, somewhere in the Northwest Territories. Um, but here, we're only halfway to the top. <laughs> and because the Arctic, uh, because, sorry, the Gulf Stream, um, provides uh, warm coastal currents all the way at the coast, uh, all the way at the coast. Um, it means that uh, the weather stays pretty mild um, all throughout the year. In fact, it's ice free. None of these ports are ever iced in. We pass the Arctic Circle. The captain usually does a little bit of a ceremony. I won't tell you what it is because that would ruin the surprise. Um, and, uh, and then we head north into um, Arctic waters, as it were. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, that day, again, a number of stops like every day. We keep going north, then we hit Tromsø. And Tromsø is uh, one of the largest cities in the, in, in, in the Arctic region of the world. And it's uh, yet another um, university town. It's the gateway for a lot of the uh, um, um, expeditions that go from Norway up to Svalbard, which is another archipelago way, way further north. Um, it's the northernmost uh, sort of um, permanently occupied place in the world, I think. Uh, and uh, Tromsø is the gateway for that. Um, a beautiful, beautiful city. Um, we'll arrive here and uh, have some um, free time to explore the city. There is a cable car from where this pic picture was actually taken uh, that you can uh, go up. There's an amazing polar museum that's right next to the, um, to the port. Um, so there's, again, lots of things to do to get a feel for what life is like um, way up in the north. But even in May, the temperature here is probably going to be sort of in the in the low teens um, is what my experience has been at this time of the year. It could be a little bit cooler, could also be a little bit warmer. Um, so anyway, that's Tromsø. Um, as we go up from Tromsø, we're going to pass through the Lofoten Islands, but we're going to hit them mostly at night. So I'll talk about them on the way back because this is for me, one of the most scenic parts of the trip. Um, so as we head into our um, 11th day, um, we then hit um, one of the other highlights of the trip, of course, the North Cape, the most northerly point on the European continent. Um, and here at this point, we are already at 71 degrees north latitude. So once again, if you sort of uh, pull out that map and see where that is in Canada, we are basically more than halfway up Baffin Island. Um, and uh, so it just gives you a sense of how the European continent is 
and certainly Norway is settled so much further north than what we are able to do again because of this Gulf Stream that um, makes settlement possible. In fact, even up here in the North Cape, you'll still see farms and so on. People actually grow stuff um, in a place where in Canada we mostly have permafrost. Um, so the North Cape is an, an included excursion. We go to this wonderful interpretive center that's there. They again have a big globe um, and they tell you a lot about um, the history, particularly of the World War days, because they actually had a lot of battles that were fought way up here in the north. I never realized that until I visited Norway and the North Cape, um, but it's quite fascinating. And um, the scenery, once again, goes without saying. Um, so one more evening on the ship. Uh, and then we will end up uh, after passing uh, Botsfjord and Öxfjord and all these places, we'll end up at Kirkenes. Uh, and Kirkenes is the turnaround point, um, the last stop before we um, turn around and head back south, or we actually head north first because we will have turned back south um, after hitting the North Cape. So we go up and around. Um, and Kirkenes is right on the Russian border. Uh, and so one of the excursions is there is the opportunity to go um, where, um, where, where the Western world, as you will, meets Russia. And of course, it's it's actually not even a fortified border uh, anymore. I, 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 there are definitely signposts and they definitely warn you not to even think about putting a foot across the border because the Russians don't appreciate that um, since we won't have visas to go to Russia. But it's interesting because, um, you know, this town obviously has Russian influence. This, the signposts are in Russian. Um, and so you get a sense about how the, the history of the, the relations are between the West and, uh, and Russia, so to speak. Um, and, and of course here, they're on the forefront of that. So uh, a very cool place to visit. We'll just spend a few hours here and then the ship will um, turn around and start heading back down. People who go on just a one-way voyage um, will, um, will either disembark here and then fly back to Oslo or they'll embark here. Um, but for reasons that I'll, I'll get into in a moment, it really makes sense to do the round trip cruise. That's why I say, if you're gonna go on this trip, um, this is the way to do it. This is the way we, we run this trip. So we head back south. And so uh, a big question is, why would I wanna go on the same route twice? Well, because the ship is a working ship and we go all day and all night, um, the itinerary is organized so that the ports that we visit during the nighttime on the way north, we visit in the daytime on the way south. So you will be quite astounded, but you, we'll see that the scenery, it looks like a different cruise because, because all many of the things that we will have missed because you're sleeping in the middle of the night will catch on the way back down. Um, and so again, another reason why it makes sense to do the round trip voyage. On the way back south, um, a couple of the excursions you could do, for example, you can get off in, in Hammerfest um, where the home of the Royal Polar Bear Society. Um, and they have a very interesting tour for, an er for early bird people. You can get up uh, at uh, the crack of dawn and go and see sunrise at the North Cape and have breakfast um, and then continue down. And they actually do a tour of an LNG, a liquid natural gas facility, which is quite fascinating for those who are interested in um, the industrial aspect of Norway, because of course, Norway has made all its money in the last uh, few decades from oil and gas. So it's, it's, it's absolutely integral to their economy and it's what's had them build such a high standard of living. Uh, so from Hammerfest, we uh, continue heading down and then the next um, very, very important site along the way, uh, after we leave uh, Tromsø, we pass through the Lofoten Islands. And I tell you, if there is a picture book of beautiful places in the world, um, it, it, you know, it has to be done here. Um, as you leave the mainland and head out to this archipelago, um, you, it, it looks like you're approaching a wall of mountains. It, it's really a stunning sight. Uh, and then you'll, you'll get there uh, and you'll start to weave through um, all of this incredible scenery with the fishing villages and the pastel, the red colored houses. Um, it, it is just for the entire day, um, one, beautiful scene after another. Uh, and so uh, again, we will pass through most of this uh, during the night on the way north, which is why it's so important to um, 
to have the opportunity to see the Lofoten Islands on the way south. One of these days, I've always wanted to run a hiking trip um, in the Lofoten Islands. So maybe the active, particularly energetic ones of you will join me and we'll, we'll hike through some of these uh, mountain chains um, in the Lofotens. Um, but this is one of my favorite places anywhere as far as scenery goes. So. <clears throat> So we'll, um, I'll just keep moving along. Uh, we will move down the coast again. Uh, and uh, along the way, we'll visit uh, beautiful little towns like uh, Mulde, um, home of a big jazz festival. Um, and we'll see more great scenery here, the Seven Sisters, um, which is a legendary um, Norse mountains. They were all named after gods. And um, you can see them here, just part of the um, amazing scenery that I just don't have words to explain it all. It's all it's all so incredible. As I say, on the way down, we'll have Trondheim, where we will again spend uh, several hours, and and uh, in, on that occasion, we'll have an included uh, excursion to go and see um, the Nidaros Cathedral as well as some of the other highlights of Norway. Um, continuing south, uh, one of the other uh, trips that you can do, uh, an optional side uh, trip. Is, uh, is called the Atlantic Road. Uh, and I was saying a bit earlier, Norway has deployed a lot of this uh, money that they have made from the oil and gas business um, in making this incredible um, infrastructure. Um, and the Atlantic Road, which is this, this road that bounces from, you know, from um, islet to islet to, you know, and on and off the mainland. It's an incredible feat of engineering. So, uh, as I say, we have an excursion that allows you to go by coach to actually drive along this thing. Um, but we'll see lots of examples of bridges and tunnels. Um, I remember being in Olesund uh, and we visited this small community that could not have had more than about 1,500 people in it. And they built a kilometer and a half long tunnel under the sea to reach this community. And I think to myself, we can't even build tunnels um, in our biggest cities, uh, let alone um, what the Norwegians do to, to service a little community of 1500 people. Well, that's the benefit of having, uh, having all that oil dispersed amongst the small population, I suppose. Um, but it is, it's the, the, the engineering feats, the, the infrastructure that they've built is really something um, eye-dropping. Um, when you get to Norway. So as I say, we continue uh, on south uh, and uh, visiting various fjords. We don't really, the ship doesn't go too deep into any of the fjords. There's some sh um, shore excursions that you can take, um, but for the most part, um, we stay along the coast uh, and see all this different scenery. We will then end up back on the 17th day um, in, um, uh, in Bergen. Uh, and uh, we'll pass the Nord Fjord as well, which is also one of the longest fjords in Norway. And we'll get off in Bergen on the last day uh, and have one final overnight um, before we um, before we say goodbye. We'll have a farewell dinner, um, one last look at Bergen, and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll be off either to continue our journey in Europe or to make our way back home. But I can tell you, all in all, it will be an amazing trip. So. Uh, let me summarize some of the details for you. Of course, everything is in the magazine. If you didn't get it already, um, you can find a link to it on our website or um, it will be um, also in the newsletter this week as it was last week. Uh, so just to give you a sense of pricing here, um, the trip isn't inexpensive. Norway, as I say, is an expensive country. That's the only drawback. When you go to buy order a bottle of wine on the boat, um, you'll 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 be a little bit shocked at the, uh, at the at the wine list at the prices. Um, but as I say, it's like anywhere. The best places in the world are just uh, you just have to dig a little bit deeper. Um, but you can see the pricing here, starting at seventy three fifty for an inside cabin. I do, however, recommend um, even though you don't spend as much time in the cabin, um, the best options are take the um, the outside cabins, the polar outside or the Arctic Superior, uh, and uh, we do have them available in single occupancy of, uh, as well, of course. Inclusions, as with most of our trips, um, pretty much all of our meals are included aboard the ship. All the transportation that I have just uh, talked about. Um, so our whole trip across uh, Norway on um, on the um, the Flam Railway and so on, as well as uh, our Oslo and Bergen passes. So um, it's really quite comprehensive. Uh, as I mentioned, important is that we have six shore excursions. 
that are included on the cruise. They have a total list that's, I think, of about 50 um, that you can choose from. But we have, uh, we've been able to get as well a shipboard credit for you that enables you to buy a couple more shore excursions. Um, so you'll certainly have um, enough to do. And we can give you details on all of that. If you're interested in doing more than what's in our program, um, Paula will send you the list of all the excursions. Uh, as far as exclusion, exclusions are concerned, of course, our airfare as usual, which we will be glad to help you um, facilitate um, cancellation insurance uh, and, of course, any other shore excursions that, um, that are optional are there. Uh, as far as airfare is concerned, uh, we hope that uh, prices will uh, stay somewhat similar to what they have been in the past. I think that Norway uh, is not a, a high volume destination from Canada. So I, I think that that bodes well, um, but consistent with most places in Europe, you're looking in um, sort of the low thousands um, uh, for, for return airfare from Canada, but we'll know more as we uh, emerge out of the pandemic and we get a better sense of, um, of what it's all about. So uh, um, before I get into the questions and I see a number of ones that have come in, uh, you are welcome to contact us at any time, email, phone, just give us a call. Happy to answer any of your questions as always. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, and so if, if you don't get your question answered today, please do drop us a note. Um, I want to touch on some of the questions that come in um, now. So um, Ardell asked if there's enough time in the Lofoten, Heightens to, uh, Lofoten Islands to do some walking and hiking. Not really, Ardell. There's a couple of shore excursions that are included there, but um, walking, hiking uh, would be several hours um, and the, the, we don't really stop at any one place. So um, if it's something that you're interested in, because I know people that have traveled with me to Norway before have uh, indicated interest in going back to the Lofoten Islands, um, we pretty much have to do a separate trip for that because uh, um, we have to keep to the to the ship's itinerary. Fran asked about um, full board on the on the ship. Yes, you get three meals a day, so a breakfast and lunch buffet, which is quite uh, extensive, and then a served meal in two seatings for dinner. Uh, and there are coffee and tea stations, I believe, for all passengers that are complimentary. But I'll double check that in case they've changed the rules. Um, um, so, uh, Helen asked who is hosting this trip? Uh, not sure yet, Helen, I am, uh, trying to slot myself in for it. So let's say tentatively me, um, because I'm dying to go back to Norway. I have to be honest with you. Um, but I will answer that question probably later this year. Uh, and so if it's not me, it'll be somebody great. I can promise you that. Um, but, um, yeah, we just have to sort of work out we have a lot of juggling to do in the wake of the pandemic. I'll just, just tell you that. Um, Nancy asked, how common is English when off the ship? Okay, it's a very good question, Nancy. Norwegians speak better English than some people in Canada do. So English is absolutely not a problem. They're taught English from an extremely young age, I think from kindergarten. So everybody in Norway speaks perfect English, not an issue whatsoever. Um, it's, uh, yeah, that's, it's one of the brilliant things throughout Scandinavia, actually, the level of English is, is miraculous. You, you hardly even can tell an accent. You can, but yeah, no, no problem with language. Ardell asked about, um, do we need to add on any extra nights to the trip? You don't need to. I think we've covered it pretty comprehensively because we've got a couple nights in Oslo at the beginning and again, two in Bergen before we get on the ship and then another one after. So unless the only reason I would um, add anything on if you wanted to explore more of Norway's far south so the town of Stavanger the incredible Prikestolen which is the this massive cliff you often see in pictures of Norway um, so there are parts of Norway to the south that you could visit uh, um, that are accessible by by ferry and rail um, but otherwise I think we pretty much nailed it so you don't really need to add um, too much on uh, let me see. Uh, da, 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 uh, yeah. Is Norway as beautiful as the pictures you see of it? It is, and even more so. Um, it is. Uh, it is really amazing. 
And Jean asked, can you fly to Canada directly from Bergen? No, you can't, Jean. Unfortunately, Bourbon's, Bergen is a pretty small town. I think it only has a couple of hundred thousand people in it. So both Oslo and Bergen, uh, you have to fly via another European gateway. In the past, we've used Iceland Air. So we've flown from Toronto to Reykjavik and then Reykjavik to Oslo. And then from Bergen, you can fly through Reykjavik back to Toronto. And it's an interesting point actually, because it's worthwhile if you haven't been to Iceland to do a stop over there. It's one of the ways that you can go. But yeah, unfortunately, in and out of uh, Norway, you have to make a stop in either direction. Good. I think I've answered all the questions. Once again, if I have not mentioned something that's important, um, please do give us a call. Next week, as I said at the outset, island hopping in Greece. It's a different way to do Greece because um, here we spend time on a few different islands rather than most people just take a boat and only have a couple of hours at each of them. Um, so join us for that next week. Thank you for listening to me on our wonderful Fjords of Norway program. I can't wait to see you on board. We're going to have a great time. Next year, we're going for sure. Um, take care of yourselves. Um, this is all going to be over before you know it, and uh, we'll be back to traveling. Have yourselves a great rest of the week.